Okay, with respect to you folks that came early on time, I'd like to get started here today. My name is Perry Clausen, Executive Director of the East San Joaquin Water Coalition. Appreciate you coming today. This is the, the th third of three meetings that we've held uh, throughout the coalition region. And uh, thank goodness for the rain for more than a few reasons. It's helped get our uh, attendance at these meetings to be far better than we anticipated. So I, I'm hoping we have enough room here for uh, those that are remaining to come in. Um, I don't know, I guess we can move, move to the middle if need be, but I want to start out be, without going into the slides immediately to give you a heads up on what you're about to hear over the next hour and a half. As you all know, many of you in the high vulnerability areas of our coalition region have had to turn in a fertilizer use report. Being first, first is not always the funnest, as you know, and if it's any, uh, any comfort, you are the first growers in California in the Central Valley to turn in a nitrogen use report. The Central Coast growers, certain segments of them have had to do the same, but we in the Central Valley in the East San Joaquin Coalition, along with the West Side Coalition, are the first to have turned in our nitrogen reports. And I don't want to underemphasize how big of a challenge that we have in front of us over the next couple years, the rest of our careers, in fact, uh, those of us that are uh, graying in, uh, in our hair here. This, this, is pro this makes pesticides, the problems we had with pesticides in surface water, in my opinion, uh, diminished. Pesticides were very difficult in surface water. Many of you were here 10 years ago when we were talking about the results that we had in our surface water monitoring. And in our sampling that we started in 2004, within a couple of years, we, had, we were finding farm use pesticides in, our, in over 25 waterways throughout the region. At that time, it seemed like there'd be a, almost an insurmountable problem. Like, how are we going to fix this? And over time and through the practices that you've used on your farms, we have almost no pesticide exceedances anymore. So the East San Joaquin Water Coalition is actually a success story that the regional water board has asked us to prepare documents, but now we did a short five minute video to use in the upcoming Regional Water Quality Control Board meeting in Rancho Cordova in their overview of the water board programs in the irrigated lands section, we are gonna have, you're, they are gonna see the video that we produced on the successes that we've had in our management plan waterways. And more specifically in this county on Dry Creek, uh, the Wellsford Road sample site. So the reason I wanna show this to you is one, it's, it, it's a good example of what we in agriculture, what we farmers can do when we see a challenge. We come up to it, we face it, we figure out how to solve it, and then we go back to work. I want to just encourage you to be going into this fertilizer reporting and all the things you're going to hear today that this is really difficult. We haven't figured it out. The regulators haven't figured it out, but, but we, want, we want to pursue the direction we think at this point is going to help us lead, be successful. And I will say, not being a patronizing request, but if you have ideas after you hear this of ways that we're going to skin this cat, we welcome those suggestions because frankly, this is, this is something that even the best agronomists are scratching their head as to what are we going to do, how are we going to solve this perceived um, over application of fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers in our crops. So before I go any further, I want to show you a video that we've produced uh, that's going to be shown at the regional bo water board. It's only five minutes long, and it's um, also going to be posted on our website if you want to show others. But it was made for uh, the Dry Creek watershed in uh, eastern Stanislaus County. I'm Harry Clausen, executive director of the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition. My job is to represent farmers to the regional water quality control board and assist them in adopting practices that are protective of surface and groundwater. I'm gonna go over the nitrogen summary report. Growers have been very receptive to changing practices. They work these lands, they live near these waterways, so they're very concerned about protecting the resources that are part of their operation and surround their farms. So when we started sampling in 2004, I was skeptical that we were going to find the problems that the Regional Water Board had described before they developed our regulation. The first time these results came across an email, I was amazed. I picked up the phone, called Michael Johnson, and said, are we sure that these results are accurate? 
When I received the email with those results, the surprising thing wasn't there was just one or two waterways with pesticides. Every single waterway that we were sampling had pesticides, nutrients, or other constituents that were above the standards set by the state. The problems that we were finding initially were insecticides applied to almonds, walnuts, and alfalfa, especially across the regions, the eastern side of our valley, where the orchards were planted very close to the waterways. When we find a pesticide in the water the first time, that's a red flag. But when we find it twice, that triggers the initiation of a management plan. And a management plan has three simple requirements. Find out the source of that exceedance, what are the potential crops that it's used on, and then work with growers to solve those problems. At first, as we had been doing for years, we held meetings with growers at restaurants and agriculture facilities, went over the problems that we had found, showed the them the, the, the crops we be believed were the, the cause of the problem, and, and worked to encourage growers to adopt practices. Unfortunately, after six months or so, we still were finding exceedances in these waterways. So what we started to do was map our regions to try to focus in on where these, these sources of products could be coming from. And that's when we used our GIS mapping and we identified our members that were adjacent to the waterways as a, as a starting point to try to determine where the source of the problem was. We had to select our priority watersheds. In other words, the waterways with the most number of exceedances. So we selected Dry Creek and Stanislaw County as our first sort of prototype of how we would address these problems. The most common insecticide incidence that we were seeing in that waterway was chlorpyrifos. This is a product used in almonds, walnuts, and alfalfa, all of which were grown in the Dry Creek watershed. Myself and Wayne Zipser got in our truck, drove out to that area, and started visiting with growers one by one, sequentially from the sampling site all the way up to the foothills. So over about a four to five month period, we visited over 30 growers that were farming adjacent to that waterway. So when we looked at the practices that growers were using to apply these products, we noticed the other pathways that these products make their way in, winter storm runoff or irrigation drainage weren't possible because the growers had irrigation systems such as micro sprinklers and drip, and there was no storms occurring in the middle of the summer. So that left spray drift as our culprit, a potential culprit for causing these exceedances. So as we started having outreach meetings with these growers, meeting with them, we especially emphasized when they were making applications next to these waterways to be extra careful to ensure the wind was blowing away from the waterway, that the outside nozzles were shut off, and that they did everything they could to prevent spray drift from moving into these waterways. Since we started sampling in 2004, we've taken over 2,600 samples and performed more than 77,000 analysis of those water samples to determine if there were farm inputs making their way into waterways. That has cost us over $10 million. After the grower visits began, we started seeing results immediately from our visits it was the following season's applications where we started to see a dramatic decline in fact an elimination of the exceedances in dry creek watershed three years after having a summer with two insecticide exceedances chlorpyrifos was no longer detected in samples collected from dry creek now six years later since we started taking this approach it's rare that we get a report back with an exceedance of a pesticide standard or any toxicity in fact, we go through a whole summer with maybe one or two exceedances that have been found throughout the 25 waterways that we sample. The management practices that growers are using are not unique to the region of the East San Joaquin Coalition. What is unique is the outreach approach, the one-on-one -on -one personal contacts that we've used with dozens and dozens of growers. No one had done that before in the Central Valley. We had no idea if it was going to work, but we found, and it was, the growers proved, that once they are aware of the problem, they are willing to act on those problems. I think that what we have in front of us, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge challenge when it comes to nitrogen fertilizer. The reason is, is that we have a very skeptical public 
and also regulators that look at the, re the groundwater problems in our aquifers. They look that we use nitrogen fertilizers and they want to point the finger at us. So in order for us to, to push back and say, no, that is not appropriate or that's not accurate, we need to develop the data to show them that this is the case. And as you know, we've never had to, to, um, to re apply or report nitrogen fertilizer applications. So what you've been getting in the mail, what you get in your member packet is an illustration of what we're going to be needing to use to show the public and the water board that we are in fact applying nitrogen in a way that's not causing degradation of our groundwater aquifers. Okay, so the coalition, I'll just go through some background information. We're, our membership and acreage has remained very stable over the last five years. Uh, after the 2012 order was adopted, as you see, we have about 3,500 members, 700,000 acres roughly that are in the irrigated lands program. The average size of our farm, though, is, is medium to small compared to some of the other regions of the state, about 200 acres. The other thing is that you, we talked about in the last two meetings about the change in requirements that are about to come about potentially from the state water board. So when our order was adopted in 2012, there was petitions filed against uh, our order by um, environmental justice community and also other coalitions. One side saying the regulations weren't strict enough, others saying, oh, they're, they're too strict, the coalitions in particular. So th there is a process going on right now that's going to dictate changes that may occur in our program, and I'll go, go through those in a minute. But the but message still going forward is please complete the reports that you have in front of you as membership, because the regional board is beginning to take enforcement action against members of all things. They're still pursuing the non-members, but members who do not complete the requirements of being in a coalition, they are beginning to actually pursue them and, and find them for not turning in these, these documents. So we want to just encourage you, continue to send in those reports. We've got staff to help you fill those reports out. If you don't know the answer, they can usually help you how to uh, help you and fill those report, reports out. So the state board process is in the middle right now. Last summer, they released a draft revision of our order, which will have the changes I'll tell you about. And they had a couple of hearings, uh, workshops throughout the Central Valley, Sacramento, and Tulare Basin. And then uh, they expect to have a released revised document order uh, by possibly the end of this month. And then once that happens, there'll be some more public hearings probably early summer, and then they may adopt, if they keep on their timelines, a revised order for the East San Joaquin Coalition, which will apply to all the coalitions in the Central Valley. And if you want to track all the paper that's going back and forth, we post all these documents on our website. So the things that the regional board is proposing, state board is proposing to do with our order is they want all of our membership to monitor domestic wells. There's a big concern out there that our domestic wells may have nitrate contamination above the drinking water. And they picked up this program or copied this from what's being required in the Central Coast region, where each the state board mandated that all our, the growers in, uh, in irrigated ag had to sample their domestic wells. So again, this is proposed uh, approach that they're putting forward. They also are talking about eliminating the low and high vulnerability designations that we have. So right now, only high vulnerability growers have to, uh, with parcels and high vulnerability, have to report nitrogen fertilizer. They're talking about erasing that designation so that everyone will have to report. The other thing is that's really given us a lot of heartburn, and we think we've turned it around, is they want us to have or want you to submit all your reports uh, electronically and online and they would be posted on a public website. So that has drawn the most vocal pushback and we believe the state boards heard us because we effectively told them if that happens the coalitions have to go away. So because why have a coalition if everything goes onto a public website and growers have to submit them. So we think with the, the, the pushback that we've done, that they will not follow through with that. But again, we gotta wait to see what the, the pro proposal comes out. Again, we won't hear what they decided in their next version of uh, the proposal until probably later this month or early in March. The other thing that they have done or proposed is to add irrigation onto our nitrogen management plans. And that includes reporting the amount of total water applied in a crop year 
and also estimating the ET or the evapotranspiration and other use, in other words, the water use that you expect for that crop in the coming year. We've told them that this is virtually impossible to do with the way irrigation systems are set up, but this is kind of the mood in, in California and especially at the state board right now. So, of course, you remember who the state board is. That's the same group that's working on these flows on your main tributaries here. So this water use is a huge factor to them. They seem to think that they can, uh, by having that information from us, they can make decisions, which we don't agree with. So the, the, the reporting requirements have just stayed the same, as I mentioned, farm evaluation, nitrogen management plant, sediment erosion control plant, uh, participating in these annual meeting events. Appreciate again you guys all coming. The thing that's, that's occurred though is even our members, we've had a couple of members who have not turned any of these reports in for three years. So that farm evaluation requirement started three years ago. We had a grower who refused to turn them in. He got fined over $30,000 for that. So the point being is these, these forms are a pain, I know, and a hassle, but try to get those completed. Use our staff to assistance so we can uh, avoid this sort of attention from the regional water board. So the nitrates in groundwater issue uh, is becoming more and more apparent as more studies are done, particularly in our region and in the Tulare Lake Basin. As we've known, many of you know that farm in these areas, we have very high nitrates, tend to be on the west side of Highway 99 to the river, almost from this region, a little north of here, all the way through Merced. As you can see on this map here, the, the darker colors are where these high nitrate levels are. And then down in the eastern part of Fresno County and Tulare County, same situation. There was even a, a study done, well, I'll get to that here in a second. So what, what the regional board or the state board looks at too and understands is that some of these are legacy problems. It may have been from farming practices from long ago, from dairies from long ago, and other things. Well, the point is that we've got to show them that we're not making it any worse. And we have argued with them for years now that, look, we've got micro sprinklers, we're doing such a better job in the way we farm, and they keep turning around saying back to us, show us the data. So that's part of this charge of us for collecting this report is to show that we are not making these problems uh, any worse in these areas. The other thing that I don't know what the rest of the story is yet to tell you even, but user protection has been pushed up to the top of the, of the heap, so to speak, of concerns. So there's, especially by the environmental justice community, where there's domestic wells or areas that are above drinking water standard, the state wants those problems rectified. There's some that are looking at agriculture for financing of that, and those, there's some legislative actions that are gonna occur this year that are too early to even discuss but the point is is that this nitrate in, in drinking water is a huge concern and we're going to be hearing about a lot in the coming years. I apologize for this uh, slide here. I didn't get this report until a couple of days ago, uh, but uh, a scientist at the University of California, Davis, whose uh, name some of us know uh, from a couple of years ago, Thomas Harder, <laughs> did another report on sources of nitrates in groundwater. And what, these, what he was able to determine using molecular analysis of these, uh, of these domestic well samples is the percentage of manure, septic, fertilizer, and natural uh, sources. So they're able, through analysis, to, to look at a water sample with nitrates and say, because of that molecule structure, that comes from a septic system, or that's a natural occurring or fertilizer. So they developed these pie charts, and we will have this posted if you're interested about it, that will show exactly what they consider these proportions from about the Modesto area, Waterford, down to about Merced, and then over on the other side of the river. Again, even though there's some areas that have a relatively low irrigated contribution or, or commercial fertilizer, the re state board is expecting a response from us to remove or mitigate that percentage that may be coming from irrigated agriculture. So the question being asked and the accusation being made is farmers are putting on too much fertilizer. And we argue continually, no, we aren't. We are trying to fulfill our crop production needs. We have, we're doing a lot better than we have before. One thing that we, the one fact that we keep going over and over and we understand is the case is if there's excess nitrogen fertilizer put on a crop, if that crop doesn't take it on, take it up, it is water soluble, it will move with the water if the water goes past the root zone and could eventually end up in the, the aquifers. So we do have areas that we 
acknowledge are high nitrates. These were identified in our groundwater assessment report. That's how we came up with the high and low vulnerability designations. And the three factors that list an area as high vulnerability is nitrates are already detected in the groundwater, shallow depth to groundwater, which means even if they're not high nitrate, it could be contaminated in, in the near future or if there is uh, sandy soil conditions. So if you had any three of those variables, that's what puts your ranch or your parcels into high vulnerability designation and hence are, are reporting the fertilizer use at this time. So what our charge is, we need to prove to them that we are not over applying nitrogen fertilizer in our current crop systems. So the tool that we've come up with to, to try to collect this information, you all are familiar with this, is our nitrogen management plan worksheet. This stays on the farm. This, is, this seems, may seem simple or complicated depending on how much you've worked with it. It took us four years to get it all boiled down into one sheet. So if you're in a high vulnerability area, what you will need to do is, is submit to us, and you have already, the nitrogen summary report. And the summary extracts information off your worksheet, and then you submit that to us. And the main points that, it, that we collect, site information, crop, total acres, the total of available and applied per acre. So that's the sum of what you apply in fertilizer and compost, what's in your irrigation water, and then it's um, and turned into a per acre application basis. And then what we've done is, back on this other box, you see this nitrogen removed. We argued successfully to the regional board that we don't know what crops remove yet. We have, a, we have a really good idea with almonds, walnuts a little better, pistachios, but a lot of the crops, we don't know when you're harvesting how much nitrogen is removed in the crop, in the hulls and shells and such. In almonds, again, we, we have a pretty good idea, 68 pounds per thousand pounds of nut meats, but many of the crops we don't know. So we, didn't, we convinced the regional board we're not gonna put that on growers because they, we don't know how we going to give them a number for them to do the calculation. So what we were successfully able to do was say, oh, let's, let's provide information that we know. We know the amount we apply and we know what our yield is. So we, we, we've asked growers to do that, that math, divide their applied by their yield on a per acre basis and report that in the column, in this last column. So the thing about this, and it, you all are probably saying, so what's that gonna tell us? What does AY have anything to do with? And we acknowledge that that is not the perfect approach. However, it's a starting point, it's a first step. Because you think about it, the, the applied fertilizer, you can say I put on 200 pounds of nitrogen. It completely does not acknowledge or track. We don't track and we're not ready and we don't think we want to track is the timing of those applications. You can put on 200 pounds right now and you know the tree's not gonna take up 200 pounds because the tree's not even taking up nitrogen. So the timing has a lot to do with how much your tree uses and how much might be available for groundwater, but we're not tracking that. So that's one weakness. And then the amount of nitrogen in each year applications. Even if you split your applications, how many pounds are going in each application? Application. Is that tree able to pick, pick all that up and use it efficiently and not have any leftover to go into groundwater? We're not, so we're not tracking that either. And then the time and the amounts of irrigation water. That's the other thing that the agronomist has said over and over. It's only half the story how much nitrogen you put on because the other half is how well are you irrigating. If you over irrigate and you fertilize correctly, there's a potential that you could be pushing that nitrogen past the root zone. But the, where we end up back at is A over Y is an indicator. It's an index. It starts, gets us started down the road of figuring out what is the comparison of your applications to other growers. That's an important point that we're going to talk more about of what, what the importance of that A over Y is. So again, just to go over agronomy 101, and we, do the, we show the regulators this repeatedly. It's a complicated process out there for fertilizer, especially with nitrogen. But you're get, you have your inputs of nitrogen, the fertilizer you apply, you may have nitrates in irrigation water, There's, you've got residual soil nitrates that, that could be available, you've got the, the, the soil microbes that could be fixing that nitrogen, and then you're adding organic material with either compost or more, manure. So it's, it's not just an easy, like our pesticides, I put four ounces per acre on, that's what I put on. There's a lot of factors. This is the easiest to measure. These are very difficult to measure accurately to know what's available to the plant. 
So that's one, one side of the balance. See, the other side is what, what's the removed? How much is removed off the field? The, the most obvious one, the easy one, is the crop harvest. But then what about the biomass of plant material that may come off? Each crop's a little different. Sometimes when you're, when you're uh, taking out your almonds, you, there's more sticks this time than last time. That's nitrogen being re removed off the field, but it's not consistent amongst every uh, operation. And then the soil organic matter, how much is removed by those microbes as they are doing what they do in the soil profile. And then we've got gas losses. Those, are, those can vary. They're not significant, but they're, they could be large in certain circumstances. Circumstance. And then you got nitrogen le nitrate leaching. How much is moving past that root zone that we put on that was not being able to be taken out with yield? So these are variable, uncontrolled. I have a board member, I hope he's not here. He keeps saying this is an unregulatable thing because it's so complicated. But that is not an answer that the regional board, at least at this point, is, is accepting from agriculture. Okay, so back to the reporting. We, we had a, a request for these summary reports last March. It was the deadline. We extended it. We were able to get 94% of our uh, members to turn in these reports, which when you think about it, is a pretty phenomenal number on one hand. On the other hand, if you're among that 6%, expect to get a nasty letter from the Regional Water Board, and if you refuse over a couple of years, you're likely to get a fine because they are unfortunately looking for examples in our coalitions and the others for people that are not uh, doing this reporting requirement. The breakdown of the, uh, of the reports because of the acreage and high vulnerability, obviously almonds was the largest, followed by grapes, pistachio, walnuts, and corn. Um, alfalfa potatoes and other crops was, were lower down the list. This, that pie chart indicates three-fourths of the grower of the products, I'm sorry, the crops that reported were almonds, grapes, and pistachios, and walnuts. So what, what we have now sent back to you, you should have got it earlier this week, late last week, is we have two requirements. We have a reporting component where we send back to you we repeat to you what we, you sent us to, so we can make sure it's accurate. And then we do one calculation on the applied minus the removed, using the removed nitrogen number that the university has developed for each crop. So we'll get back to that in a little bit, but that's a requirement of the A over Y to report to you. We have done the A minus R as part of uh, our voluntary effort because of the understanding of the materials that we believe comes out of seeing the A minus R. So that number, the applied minus removed, is not turned into the regional board. All we turn in is the A over Y averages for, for each of the crops in a summary report. So what that enables us to do and you'll see this in a minute, is we can compare your application rates in almonds to all the other almond growers in, in our coalition region. And then also we have an education component as a requirement. You all picked up those brochures coming in that, the, uh, that are based on what the, the University of California developed on crop consumption and applications. So we're required to distribute that information to all of our high vulnerability growers to give you an idea of what, where these numbers are coming from. So as, as I explained, the A over Y, pretty straightforward approach. You divide the eight total applied nitrogen over the two total yield per acre, and then you get a, an average for the total yield per management unit and total applied per management unit on a per acre basis. And then when you send that number to us, we calculate then that number against the nitrogen removed that the university has developed. So that's, we've saved you that step. We're doing that for you. That's a very, that's a variable number that Michael Johnson's gonna explain to you where we got and how we're working with that. So our, our goals with this outreach is to inform you of where your performance is to other growers and then com compare your performance to the numbers that the, region, that the uh, University of California have developed in the commodity groups uh, for your particular crop. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break now. Michael Johnson's gonna come up and you, guys, you all know Michael, he's been working with us on the surface water program and him, he and his staff are very integral in developing uh, these reports. 
All right, so as Perry said, my name's uh, Mike Johnson. Um, we've been working for you guys since 2004, uh, doing all your, your technical support for you. And my job here today is to talk to you a little bit about uh, nitrogen remove numbers, your A over Y, outliers, what that means, what it doesn't mean. Uh, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly on Wednesday when we were in Merced giving this presentation to the growers down there. Um, I went into great detail. I'm kind of a numbers guy, and I went into a lot of detail about the numbers. And Perry reminded me after that presentation that nobody cares. So I'm going to try to stick to the kind of the, 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 the big points here, and, and we'll get through this. But I will be available afterward. And anybody, you can, if you have questions, I'll be around to answer any questions you've got. Okay, um, the nitrogen removed, when this, this all boils down to really, in your yield, how much nitrogen do you pull off of that field? And the regional board wants the comparison to how much you put on. The idea being that if you balance that in some way, if you put on a certain amount and you pull off that amount, you remove it, then there's not going to be anything left over to go to groundwater. The problem is, how do you estimate the amount of nitrogen that removed? Perry brought, you know, mentioned this here in a minute ago. It's, it's not an exact science. Um, for almonds, the numbers are actually much better than they are for pretty much any other crop. But um, we don't have a lot of information available on how much nitrogen is removed when you harvest, pull your material off, and how much gets incorporated into your trees, for example. So what we, we, the University of California, they put together a list. There was an initial list that's actually on the, the Department of Food and Ag's website. Just recently, the university put together a list of about another 70 crops worth of in removed numbers, the amount of nitrogen removed in the harvest. And so those are the numbers that, that we are stuck with for right now. They're the only ones available. The regional board wants us to use them when we do this reporting. But um, just as a reminder, these things will be refined over the course of time. And so there's, there's a lot of work still left to be done. So we could come back two or three or four years from now and say, you know, all of this in remove stuff that we told you three or four years ago, now it's all changed. So there's a lot of things that are still, still in flux, a lot of things that need to be fully developed. Okay, so th this is, this is a, a box and whisker plot. This is the way we're required to report information to the regional board. And this is just a general example. And you can see here's the box, here's the whisker, and then these two points on top, in this case, this is just a, an example we put together. Those are what are called outliers. They're the top above, the, this is 90% of all the growers, they're A over R information. So, and actually not growers, parcels. So there are two parcels here that are considered outliers. And we're gonna talk about outliers here as we work through this. The regional board in, the way, in our old order said, you have to report all of your information, A over Y, A over all that stuff, in this way. And so we said, okay, it's written into our order, we can't change it, and this is what it looks like, okay? They require that we do it on an individual uh, township range basis, so this last one here is probably difficult for you to read from, from back in the back. This is uh, seven south, 15 east. There are 17 parcels in this, uh, reported in that particular set of 36 sections. And here are the outliers. In those, in those sections. Those are two parcels that are the top 10% of all parcels reporting with respect to, in this case, A over Y or A over R because we take and directly convert Y, your yield, to R, the amount of nitrogen removed. And a couple of things real quickly to look at. This is the value, A over R value of one means that that ratio is one. The amount that you apply and the amount that you remove is exactly the same, okay? And as you can see, almost, there are very few parcels down here that are at one or below one because you, it's, it's basically impossible to take off exactly what you put on. 
Okay, so, but this, the, the, there's, the other message here is this is the way that your information goes to the regional board. So when you report back to us on your summary report, if you're in the high vulnerability area, you, you submit your, your uh, summary report to us, we aggregate it, and we put it together for the regional board just like that. So again, nothing that you send to us gets sent individually to the regional board. Okay, so if you combine all of those township and ranges, all those things into one look, one uh, box and whisker plot, the, the, the big black line there is sort of the median, the middle of the distribution, and all of these parcels here are considered outliers. The regional board has dictated to us that anybody in the top 10%, any parcel in the top 10% is considered an outlier. We argued with them that that was not a logical way to do this because the top 10% this year are outliers. So let's say everybody improves their performance and all of these points move back down, what's gonna happen next year to the top 10%? They're gonna be considered outliers. Those parcels are always gonna be outliers. So you could do a terrific job managing your operation and the top 10% will still be considered outliers. So regional board recognized that and so we're working with them to come up with a more sane, to a, you know, a better way of evaluating nitrogen management and, and the performance on the parcels. Okay, this should look familiar to you, and it's a little difficult here off the edge of the screen, but over on the, on the far, on your far left, there's a set of management units, and in this case, the, the individual this is, a, this is a, just a made up example. The individual has, the management unit names are numbers. 66, 70, 71, 72, 73, 75, for example. Um, the crop is almonds, the age of the orchard, the acres involved. From your summary report, this is the amount of nitrogen that was applied to each of these management units. This is the A over Y number that you reported as well. The yield was back calculated from the A and the A over Y numbers that you submitted. Okay, so this should, this, you should have something that looks like this if you received a packet back from us. This is the next part of the, the packet that you received. Again, the management unit names, the um, age, the A over Y, the applied. This is the R, this is the amount removed. This is the conversion that we do with your yield. And the number here, A minus R. This number, we report this number to the regional board, but not on an individual basis. It's kind of mushed together again with all of the stuff that's, that's required. The regional board originally wanted us to come up with a number, 100, five, 500, that was the number that you shouldn't exceed. And the problem is, of course, is that, as everybody knows, your ranch is different than lots of other ranches, and they wanted a single number that would work from Bakersfield to Reading, and that's not possible. So we've talked to them about this. They understand that. They've now backed away from looking at a number as the number that your parcel needs to, to meet, to reach. But there are lots of groups out there who believe that there should be a number that needs to be developed and that the regional board can regulate on. So we're working to try to stop that. Um, the numbers that have been thrown around, so you see the numbers here, they range from 112 up to 185. The number that the regional board's um, been given by, by several of the other groups, environmental justice group, for example, is about 35. They figure that if that, that number is about 35, that everything's good. We're, we're working very hard to make sure that that number does not become uh, a reality. Okay, so the, the outlier, I've already sort of walked through the process. If the, the outliers aren't, aren't growers, outliers are based on parcels. So you may have no parcels that are outliers, you may have one parcel, it, it just depends upon where it falls. And so an outlier is any 
parcel for which your A over Y is in the top 10% of all growers who have almonds or walnuts or pistachios. So it's all compared across the same crop. Um, but those are, those are basically statistical outliers. It's just a number. There are a large number of reasons, and I'm gonna show you some things here in a minute. There's a large number of reasons why you may be an outlier. You may have a parcel that's an outlier for a perfectly good reason. And Perry's gonna go walk through an example here in a minute. But there, so for example, there are lots of, of places in uh, sort of toward the east edge of the, the coalition, I'm sorry, the west edge of the coalition region here that um, they're being irrigated with uh, groundwater that has very high nitrates in it. I, I talked to a, a gentleman last year at this meeting who said that he didn't apply any synthetic fertilizer at all. He had an, way more than enough nitrate in his irrigation supply water to satisfy all of his nitrogen needs for his crop. So he didn't even, he didn't apply anything, and yet he could still be considered an outlier even though he's essentially doing what's called pump and fertilize. So the regional board, again, we went and talked to them about this, and the regional board recognizes that that's true. And in fact, the environmental justice community recognizes that those kinds of things also occur. So one of the things that we're going to do is if there's a, if you have, if you manage your own or whatever parcel that's considered an outlier, we're probably going to send you back a, a short survey, we'll get it mailed out to you, because we want more information from you. Your summer report that you turn into us, your farm evaluation that you turn into us, doesn't contain enough information that will allow us to kick that parcel out of outlier status. So one of the things we're gonna ask you, for example, is what's the concentration of nitrate in your well water if you, if you irrigate with, with groundwater? And Perry's going to show you an example here that, that uh, demonstrates just how much nitrogen is applied just through normal irrigation if you have uh, nitrate in your, in your groundwater. So, re but Regional Board recognizes that they will allow us to kick you out of the outlier status, that parcel that you, that you own but we need the information back for you, from you. So we, we apologize, we're sending out a lot of things to you, we ask for a lot of things back, there's lots of deadlines and so on, but this will be something that'll come out to you. If you get it back to us, we can help you get out of, get that parcel out of outlier status. Okay. Okay, so the, when this, this should also look relatively familiar. Um, one of the, um, the box and whisker plots are, are what we have to report to the regional board, but when we report back to you, we're required to report back to you your the, the relative, where you sit relative to everybody else. We decided that the box and whisker plots probably weren't going to be very helpful. So what we did is we went back to the the whole the old bell curve, right? So if you remember back to, to school, getting graded on the bell curve, this is the bell curve for almonds. Here, this line here may be a little difficult to see for those of you way in the back, but there's a line right about here, and that line is the top 10% of all almond grow, uh, all, parcel, uh, all parcels on which almonds are grown. And in this case, this example that we've provided for you, this particular uh, member had three parcels that are not considered outliers, and two, the red dots, that are considered outliers. Okay, so if you get this material back and you look, if your parcels, if you have any, uh, any, all the parcels are green, you have no outliers. If you have parcels that have little red dots there, those are considered outliers. Okay, now, one of the other things that we've, we're doing is um, we're saying, okay, the, there's a, if you think about outliers, in an outlier with an A over Y, those are, that's the ratio that we have to, to, to measure, you can either have a large A, a low Y yield, or some combination of the two, right? It's not just, in this case, it's not just an over application of nitrogen. In this case, we plotted where this grower sits with respect to the amount of uh, nitrogen applied, and in fact, none of those are considered outliers. So this individual, this member, applies about the same to most all of the parcels on a per, uh, per acre basis, pounds per acre, 
and they're, you know, they're sort of in the ballpark of where you would expect for that sort of a yield. Okay, so the, the next three slides, I'm gonna walk through almonds, pistachios, and walnuts. This just gives you some information on the number of parcels that were purported, the number of growers, and so on. But what I wanna do is draw your attention to this, these numbers here. So this is for almonds, this is the median A. So the middle of the, everybody applied about 171 pounds an acre. The A over Y value is about 97. And if you had your A over Y above 170, that would be considered an outlier. Pistachios. Median A was 125 pounds. The median A over Y was 71. And the, the top 10% were above 500. And walnuts, again, 150, 40, and then above 90. So the, there's th they're vastly different across the, just the three different nut crops here. Okay, so why, why could you be an outlier? Again, um, there's all kinds of things that, that um, could affect your yield. So last year, you might not have had enough water. The quality of the water that you irrigated with might not have been very good. There's all kinds of perfectly normal reasons. I had a, uh, a gentleman on, on Wednesday um, basically say that this winter, with uh, lots of rain and wind and that sort of thing, that in his walnut uh, orchard, he's losing trees. They're, they're getting plowed over, and then, you know, they're getting dumped over, and in fact, if he's already applied, then his yield is going to be low because he didn't anticipate that sort of thing happening. Those are perfectly reasonable and legitimate reasons for having a low yield. Um, pest damage and, and so on. So th when we send you that, that, that little survey, those are the kinds of things we want to know from you. Did you have those kinds of, of problems, things out of your control, pest outbreaks, whatever, so that we, again, those are ways to get you kicked out of that parcel, kicked out of the outlier status. Um, there is the possibility that you were applying more nitrogen than you should have. And so this process of getting the information back from you as a survey, uh, from the surveys, will allow us to verify whether that parcel is a real outlier or whether there's a reason we can kick it out. Okay, so what's expected if, if you have a parcel that's, that's an outlier parcel, what's the expectation? Um, again, we're gonna send you the questionnaire. Please provide that information back to us. That's the first thing. Um, the, we've had lots of calls. People have called up recently. Katie's been sort of inundated with calls saying, am, am I in trouble? You know, I've got a red dot, am I in trouble? And the answer is no, you're not in trouble. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at this sort of on a three-year time period because things happen year to year that change your A over Y. And so this year you may have a little bit higher, next year you may be a little bit lower, but things average out over time. So we're not going to do anything at all until we get at least three years information from you. And then what we're proposing to the regional board is that nobody takes any action of any kind until at least five years down the road. So there's plenty of time for this process to be, you know, if you, if you have a parcel that's an outlier parcel, you know, I don't want to say don't worry about it, but there's plenty of time to make sure that that parcel gets um, out of that outlier status. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is after we receive that survey information from you, and again, it's just a very short, you know, sort of one page front and back. Um, when we get that information back from you, we will turn, uh, in turn, give you back an assessment of whether it's an application issue, whether it's a, a yield issue, right? And then the recommendation we have is that you go talk to your CCA, you go talk to your agronomist about how you might be able to remedy that problem. And it may not, it may not be anything that you can do other than just wait till the next year. We've got a lot more water this year, right? And, and, and that, may be, that may be the solution. Now, the other thing, many of you have heard these, these terms before. The agronomists certainly have four principles of nitrogen fertilizer application that, that are solid among any crop that you grow. They call it the four R's. They're very basic, comes out of the Midwest, but it's, it's applicable here. It's the right, apply the right rate, the correct rate for the crop yield potential and what that crop can remove from the ground. 
apply at the right time. I mean, they, my dad used to grow peaches back in the 50s and 60s. They, they would put a slug of fertilizer on in, in uh, October because then the bloom would come out really good. Well, a winter like that, you put on something in October, half of it is in the groundwater because it's leached past the root zone. So that's a, a poor example of an extreme thing, but the right time is when that tree, in the case of this meeting, when the trees are taking up that, uh, that nitrogen, I've got a crop consumption curve in a minute, that that is what the right time is all about. And then in the right place. I mean, we're doing really good with micro systems and drip systems. It's putting it right in that root zone. We've got to make sure that we put it in the right place that's usable by the, by the crop. And then the right source. I mean, there's a million and one types of nitrogen. You've got triple 15 and Cal-17, can, can 17 and ammonia nitrate. You've got all these different formulations. Talk to an expert and fertilizer to understand what is the best product that's going to minimize the amount of leaching past the root zone. Especially if you're doing flood irrigation of walnuts, there's a form of nitrogen you can put on that will keep it in the root zone. Other forms you put on, it's going to go straight past the root zone. So the four R's are things to definitely check with your the farm advisors, the university, uh, the, the private consultants, because they really are, and the, and the commodity groups are really beginning to define four R crops, these four R's. And then this is just an example. You got a handout when you came in that the Department of Food and Ag has put together. They take information from the universities, <clears throat> excuse me, and compile it in a, a read, easily read format. And then these are the crop consumption curves. This, I think Almond Board gets the best credit for this. They've done a great job with almonds of understanding when is that tree hungry for nitrogen. And put, feed that crop before the period it's hungry so it takes up as much as you can po it possibly can. Uh, as you can see with this, some of you can see it, is uh, it, right after fruit stat, that, that demand for nitrogen starts climbing. So you want to be just a little ahead of that. And then once you get close to harvest, time to chop off the nitrogen. Many people already do that. Most do. And, so the, and then after harvest, the consumption is almost none. So these are the curves that the university is developing for us for our major crops. We need them for all the other crops that we grow. I know there's not one for nectarines, the crop that I grow, but I'm assuming it's going to be close to that. But that's the kind of information that's going to enable us to apply nitrogen in a way that's complete, to make it completely used by the crop that we're growing. And then questions to ask the agronomist are how to, how to implement those four, four R's. And really what we want to do is maintain our yields when we, based on the amount of nitrogen that we apply. We don't want to cut back just for cutback's sake because that doesn't necessarily isn't the answer. So we want to know what is the, uh, what is it, the acceptable yield or the acceptable amount to put on to get the yield potential that I have. And then how much is it going to cost me for different formulations and such. And then if you want to look for a certified crop advisor, most of the fertilizer suppliers have them on staff. There's a website that you, you can go to to find uh, the certified crop advisors. And then, of course, ask them. Some of them are assisting their growers in completing the nitrogen summary report. And if you don't, on the high vulnerability, you need to have that sign off by a CCA. If you want to get self-certified, you can go to a course, uh, courses that are available to get that training. And uh, Katie's going to tell you about those uh, meetings that we have scheduled here. They're taught by CCAs using University of California curriculum, and they're, um, they're going to be scheduled throughout this winter and spring. Okay, my last slide before we go back to Mike with surface water. The other thing that well, the regional board is really focusing on is wellhead protection. These folks have inspectors, and they are windshield inspectors. There's nothing you can do with groundwater to inspect fertilizer applications and, and leaching the groundwater. However, they can see wellheads, and they are going to really focus in the next coming years on two things, wellhead protection and abandoned wells. So for wellhead protection, make sure that if you have a drip system or micro sp sprayer system that you have a backflow or a check valve on that system. If you lose power, you can suck down a tank of that, that size of fertilizer in no time with a backflow on that. The, the, well, the water pulls back in that well. So, so please try to get a backflow or check valve on that system. The other thing is that try to keep a good, clean wellhead area around your, your pumping station. Try to uh, 
eliminate any standing water because this in a saturated situation over a summertime, you get a spill in there. That's a direct pathway into your wellhead if it's not properly sealed. So again, don't give them an excuse to drive by and see that wellhead with, with anything that might attract attention. The other thing is abandoned wells. Just give you an idea what the thinking is over there. We are in the middle of negotiating with the regional board the groundwater quality management plans. This is the things that, that follow up similar to what we did with surface water. One of the things they put in our plan that we were able, we hopefully remove was go back to all the well records that DWR has and find all these abandoned wells and make sure they're properly sealed. We said, no way, there's no way the coalition can do that. The point being, though, is they have got well abandoned wells in their crosshairs. I don't know where this is going to go, but there's studies, there's been several studies done that show that, um, that those old wells that we have could potentially be direct conduits down into groundwater if there's some sort of spill or if they're in an agriculture area that's, that's, that's fertilized at high levels. I don't know if those tr studies are true, but the point being is a regional board is, is really trying to ramp up efforts on abandoned wells and stay tuned. I'm not sure where they're gonna be going on that. <clears throat> okay, one other thing, the pump and fertilize. This is a term that's been coined and being used. The regional board loves it. This really is, when you think about our groundwater aquifers, this is the only practical way that we're going to get nitrates out of groundwater, short of winters like this where we get a lot more fresh water infusion. But when we pump the water and our crop uses that fertilizer, that's removing fertilizer out of the groundwater. So it's being taken up by the tree. When you look at the analysis of a well and do the calculation, if you've got moderately high nitrate levels in your groundwater, you've got, a, you've got a fair amount of nitrogen that you have available for free to put on your crop. And this is an example, 35 part per million. That's not really a high well considering what's going on, on the west side of this uh, freeway. But if you put 35 inches on, you have 35 part per million water, you're putting on 236 pounds of nitrogen in those 30 inches of water. However, let me caveat that because this is an important principle to understand, is that 30 inches has to be completely taken up by the crop, which means you have to have 100% irrigation efficiency, which nobody has. So when you're doing your worksheet and you, you got to kind of guess, where is my irrigation efficiency? In other words, if I put 30 inches on, is that tree taking 30 inches up? If it is, you have 236 pounds per acre available. If you're 50% efficiency, you're only taking up 115, 118 pounds of nitrogen. So that's a very important point. It's, it's been pointed out to us many times by agronomists. Your, your irrigation efficiency has everything to do with the, the, the uptake of that nitrate in your groundwater. But the point is, is it, it is usable. University studies have shown that fertilizer or that nitrate in the groundwater is usable for your crop production. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to Mike for a few minutes. We do need to go over our surface water results here as part of our outreach. So Mike's got just a few slides to explain to you. Okay, Perry's right. I'm, <clears throat> one of the requirements of the order is that we need to give you uh, an update on surface water quality results. Uh, I've got three slides is all, and then I'm, when I'm done, uh, Katie Capadonico is going to come up and walk through some membership um, items with you. And then when that's done, there will be, um, you, you should have received a yellow sheet when you came in, that's the survey. And when we're done with that, there'll be an explanation of what that is, and we'll walk you through it and uh, complete that. And then, then there'll be, uh, if you RSVP'd, there'll be some, some lunch here. Okay, um, just a real quick reminder of our monitoring program. We have divided up our uh, coalition region into six different zones. Each zone has a single site that is called the core site for that zone, and we monitor at that site 12 months of the year. Um, as a matter of fact, we'll be out, I believe, on Tuesday of this upcoming week. Um, you'll see our vans out here collecting water where we can get guys close to the water without getting them swept away. Um, we, we monitor for a whole series of pesticides, nutrients, toxicity, physical parameters, bacteria, a whole series of things. It's a very expensive program. 
And uh, just like every year, if the water quality is good at that core site, we, we can stop just with that kind of monitoring. If we have a problem, and the regional board defines a problem as, for example, finding uh, a chemical in the water at a concentration higher than they allow. So this, the state has a whole series of uh, numbers, concentrations of chemicals that they will allow in the water if you find something above those concentrations. That's considered a problem. If we have a problem, we then um, potentially have to start monitoring what we call our represented sites in each zone. Um, and then Perry talked earlier, um, the, the video talked about the, the problems at Dry Creek and the management plan. If you have two of those problems, so if we have two um, instances in which chlorpyrifos, Lorsban, is found in the water at the, the number of concentration higher than the state allows, we have to develop what's called a management plan, which tells the state how we're going to make sure that that problem doesn't reoccur. And then we have to monitor again. Um, real, just real quick, here's all of the monitoring locations, all of the watersheds, and so here's the, the Stanislaus County. We have a whole series of these things up. We monitor um, from month to month anywhere from just a few sites all the way up to 18, 20, 24 sites. So it depends on the month and what we monitor for, but um, we have a fairly extensive monitoring program. Despite that, water quality here has been very, very good. Okay, so here is the um, slide of the water quality results, my last slide. And it's hard to read, but this has physical parameters, dissolved oxygen, pH, and SC, specific conductance, which is a measure of salt, bacteria, this is the E. coli, uh, nutrients, we have ammonium, and we have nitrate, and we have algae toxicity. Um, what you don't see here, which is terrific, is pesticides. In years past, we've had a whole series of columns with a whole bunch of pesticides up there. There are no pesticides this year. So the, the year runs, the, we have to report on the years from September, or October of six, uh, 15 through September of uh, 15, and, uh, or sorry, September of 16, and in that entire year, we have had no exceedances of pesticides. Water quality is terrific. All of this algae toxicity, a large amount of that algae toxicity was a result of the Department of Waterways and Boating, Boating and Waterways, whatever that thing's called, spraying, and do, they, had a, they had a very active program spraying for hyacinth. And a lot of the toxicity that we found, we could trace back to uh, waterways and boating. Okay, what you see here are, the, are your water quality results for Merced County. Uh, the first set of columns, you see the DO, that's dissolved oxygen. The pH, that's a measure of the acidity of the water. SC is a specific conductance, that's a measure of the salt content of the water. Um, you, the next column over is bacteria, that's E. coli, that's the bacteria we look for. Um, then we have nutrients, ammonia. And then there are a series of metals, arsenic, copper, and lead. And finally, toward the end, we have the chlorpyrifos, that's the active ingredient in Lorsban, diuron, and malathion, and then the toxicity, we have algae toxicity. So if we go down to the bottom row, and you see grand total, you see that for the DO, PH, SC, E. coli, and ammonium, that we have by far the largest number of exceedances, but those are parameters that we cannot manage. There is very little that a, that a member can do to implement practices on their branch that can do anything about the dissolved oxygen in the, in the creek. When you have very little flow, uh, hot temperatures in the summer, you are not gonna have dissolved oxygen in the water. You are gonna have elevated pH. Um, Bacteria is found everywhere. Um, it's, it comes from natural sources, it comes from septic systems, it comes from all sorts of places. The metals, arsenic, copper, and lead. Uh, arsenic is a naturally occurring problem, naturally occurring compound. Copper, we have uh, been working on copper for many years, and we still don't understand exactly where the copper comes from. 
And lead, lead is probably a legacy problem left over from uh, disposed uh, car batteries. It's also, there's also lead still in the soil from the area where there was leaded gasoline. But none of those, uh, arsenic and lead, neither of those are applied by irrigated agriculture. There is some copper applied by irrigated agriculture, but um, we believe that the, the sources of copper uh, are not uh, ranches and farms, but um, other sources. We do have issues, however, with the chlorpyrifos, diuron, and malathion. So we had two exceedances of the chlorpyrifos. We had one of diuron and one of malathion. Over the course of the, the next year, we're going to have to have management plans for those sites, and we'll have to work on getting those cleaned up. But uh, I believe that we can do that without any trouble, just like we've done in the past. And the algae toxicity, the algae toxicity here is probably a function of uh, herbicides in the water. Um, we're not sure exactly which herbicides, but again, those things can be cleaned up relatively well. But the bottom line overall is that water quality in Merced County was very, very good. Even though there were two exceedances of chlorpyrifos, one of diuron and one of malathion overall, that is very good water quality. And the other important thing is that from uh, October of 2016 until the present, we have had no exceedances for any of these uh, chemicals at all. So water quality has been very, very good up to this point this year. Okay, what you're looking at here are the water quality results for Madera County. And you can see that there were four locations that we monitored in uh, Madera County. Ash Slough was dry, essentially all of the monitoring events, four out of the five. And Cottonwood Creek was dry every single time we visited, all 12 months of the year. So we have no results for there. But what you see here overall is that water quality is very, very good. Uh, dissolved oxygen and pH, dissol DO is the dissolved oxygen. It measures how much oxygen is in the water. pH measures the acidity of the water. Um, there are a few exceedances there, but when you have almost no flow and very hot uh, temperatures of the water, you can't have any dissolved oxygen in the water and pH is generally elevated. There's some bacteria in the water, E. coli, um, at Dry Creek at Road 18, there's two exceedances there. But there are many, many sources of E. coli, a large number of them natural sources, um, septic systems, and so on. And so it's not really possible to determine exactly where the E. coli comes from. And metals. <clears throat> we had some copper issues. Um, we've always had copper issues in Madera County. We have worked for years to determine what are the sources of those copper problems, and we have yet to been able to find um, the exact source. But we're still working, uh, working on that issue, but um, we're, we're just not making a lot of headway, um, but we do think that it is not a function of irrigated agriculture. But the most important thing here on this slide is what you don't see. And what you don't see are any exceedances of pesticides and you see no toxicity. So overall, with respect to discharges from irrigated agriculture, water quality here in, in this time period, October 15 to September 16, was terrific. And from September or October 16 until the present, water quality has continued to be good. So over the last year and a half, um, or even more, water quality in Madera County has been perfect, basically. And that's a result of all the hard work that growers do to keep the discharges out of the water. So, bottom line, water quality again last year was terrific. Thank you all, because it's because of your efforts that the water quality is good. What this also means is that your dues stay low because we don't have to do a lot of extra monitoring. Water quality is good. Regional board recognizes water quality is good. We can keep our monitoring program at a low level, sort of at a maintenance level, and keep your costs down. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Katie so we can kind of move you along and get you here uh, to lunch. Hello everyone, my name is Katie Campadonico and I kind of manage the grower relations aspect of uh, everything you get. So I'm gonna quickly kind of cover everything here, including your membership packet, which was the, the big packet that we sent out this year to try and eliminate some of the mailings. Although you have been getting a lot of postcards recently, we're trying to base um, 
self-certification meetings that we're hosting on demand. So if there's continued demands, we'll continue to host those self-certification meetings for nitrates and sediment. So to start, we'll go over the membership packet. You probably got it late October, early uh, November, and it's a colorful packet, red, yellow, green, blue are the colors we sent out, and it has multiple tabs that correspond with all of the different requirements that we have. So there's an overview and calendar um, that has some of the dates, not all of the dates. We continue to add them based on demand, like we were saying. Membership invoice, farm evaluation, nitrogen management plan summary report. Uh, the summary report, quick note on that, if you are under 60 acres, you have one more year, so you have a delayed requirement. You don't have to turn that in until 2018. Um, anyone over 60 acres does need to turn that in this year. The nitrogen management plan worksheet which stays on farm, and the sediment and erosion control plan it was actually mailed uh, December of 2015, so last year. Anyway, um, this year all of the requirements are due on March 1st, and some completed to stay on farm and some are turned back into us. Uh, we are hosting these uh, ground, uh, yeah, the, the crop specific member meetings like you're at today, so there will be another round. Here in March, uh, we're gonna have the three meetings in the three locations and we'll cover the crops listed, uh, but corn, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, and grapes will be covered at those meetings. But if you're attending today, you've fulfilled your membership requirement. Uh, we are hosting the self-certification trainings. Again, these ones are for nitrogen. Uh, these are to help certify your own plan. Uh, if you're doing the, the worksheet, you can have it certified by a CCA. It does not require that you attend these, but this does help you if you want to certify your own plan. We're going to have one in Modesto at Harvest Hall at the Ag Center on March 8th, and then in Merced at the Fairgrounds on March 9th. So you can RSVP for those. Uh, the sediment and erosion control plan self-certification, we hel we're holding this one on the 28th. It's already full, so we've got emails in to uh, our engineer to host a second one and a third one if needed. But we kind of booked a small uh, facility, kind of seeing what our, our interest level was, and it's been huge. So we will be hosting more of these, and you'll get a postcard with the updated dates on it. Uh, we're continuing to host our membership workshops, you know, the open office hours we do if you want to come in and get help with any of your requirements you have. I host them in Stanislaus County Farm Bureau. I normally go 10 to 2. Uh, Merced County Farm Bureau, Sydney, who's here in the back, she uh, hosts those ones, and her calendar's also online. And we also have someone in Madera County, if you're here from Madera, Brittany Grogan is there, and she's happy to help you with any of those. Um, so anyway, look on the calendar or give us a call. We are happy to schedule appointments with you. These are just open office hours. We're always guaranteed to, to be there, so you can always catch one of us in the office during this time. And kind of our last change we've made is we've uh, made this new membership portal. So anyone who has an email associated with their account can now comply online. Uh, we're happy to set up new accounts. So if you do have an email or you want to comply online, see us in the back and we can get you a password and set up online. But you can pay your dues, um, update any of your member information, or also like parcels, acreages, crops, any of that changes. You can now do it on your own on the portal. Uh, we can do the summary report and farm evaluation as well on the portal. So that just gives you another way, hopefully making it a little easier to you know, combat all of the different requirements we have at the Water Quality Coalition. And this is kind of a snapshot of the farm evaluation. So it lists all your parcels and acreage on one side, and then you can click the individual things that apply to those ones um, on the portal, update it, save it and it'll save as you go and submit it at the end and you can print a copy for your files as well. And if you have any questions, I'll be in the back, but that's the number to reach us at, 846-6112. Our phones have been pretty busy, so if we don't get to you on the first try, we'll get right back to you. And thank you for being patient and being here. I think Perry's gonna come up and finish it off. Thank you.